Hey, this is Blake Murphy from Sportsnet, and you're listening to The Walk-Off with Scott and Adam. Very excited to be joined by today's guest, the host of the brand new Jays Talk Plus on Sportsnet 590, The Fan, and wherever you get your podcasts. Blake Murphy, welcome to The Walk-Off, man. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me on, guys, and thanks for that excellent Matt Gage interview you did the other week. <laughs> uh, it was very good to help me get up to speed on on his backstory and uh Hey, yeah, who knew that you could just watch another Major League Baseball player and be like, ah, oh, I got to pitch like him, and now I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the arm slot I should be using, yeah. yes. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was kind of cool because we interviewed Matt, and then uh, about a week and a half later, he got called up. But that's not the first time that's happened to us. We had the same thing happen to us for Taylor Sacedo and Kirby Sneed last year, as well as Josh Palacios, so... You know, for all the minor leaguers out there, if you want the walk-off bump, we're easy to get to, right? So, yeah. This is look. If if next week I'm on the TV broadcast or something like that <laughs> instead of a radio show, it's a uh, it's a real thing. All right. It's a real like thing. It. All right, buddy. Before we even get into the Blue Jays here, I did want to just say congratulations on the new show. I know I've personally thought for a while now that the demand for a daily Jays show was there. Uh, I've really enjoyed what you've done the last uh, two weeks with it. Well done, man. Thanks. I appreciate it. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. I know like a lot of people know me mostly as a Raptors guy at From this the Raps, point. Absolutely. Yeah. But, um, you know, in my Twitter handle, there's an ODC at the end. Blake Murphy was taken. And that's that's a nod to the first ever blog that I had, which was like an analytics blog called the on deck circle. That was basically all baseball. Um, so, yeah, that's I mean, like I'm a I'm a hockey guy on the playing side and like growing up. But baseball is what I first started writing about. So this is a nice kind of full circle and a nice new challenge for me what would you say stands out the most to you between how you cover both baseball and basketball obviously some substantial differences there yeah i mean the the wealth of data available to you in baseball is great um it's kind of like when i used to write a fan graphs or rotographs like you never run out of material i was talking to ben clemens from fan graphs the other day i was like how do you even come up with the story idea of like i'm gonna dig in on adam simber's slider against lefties and he's just like well my job is basically to look at fan graphs pages all day and come up with stories so uh, i love that side of baseball um i do think you know there's a little bit more romanticism around baseball i guess the the being outside the you know fathers and sons or, or family stuff or whatever, um, fathers and daughters, mothers and daughters, whatever, um, around that. Basketball is a lot more uh, star-driven. Mm -hmm. So certainly I, I still kind of come at basketball with the same sort of like data-minded approach, but it's a lot more – baseball just gives you a lot more ways to thread data through storytelling, whereas um, basketball, you got to hit the story elements first – and use the other stuff to, to kind of fill in the gaps. Um, I, I approach it mostly the same. Like, it's just how I think about things. Uh, it, may, it would maybe be different if I were writing about the Jays full time, like I did with the Raptors, but I, I don't think it's too, too different. The, honestly, the biggest difference is 162 games instead of 82 games. <laughs> yeah, right. And it's even tough as a fan to sometimes uh, switch your brain into thinking into that 162. You know, like it's so easy as a baseball fan to mid-May, and we watched the Jays fans do it this year, right? Kind of hit the panic button in game like 42 where they're like, oh my God. And it's like, well, you're a quarter of the way through the season. And then from my perspective, hosting a daily radio show, like 162 is way better. I remember there were, there were some times this year where I'd be a guest on William Liu's Raptor show on our network, and it was like the third day off in a row or the second day off in a row. It's like, I have nothing left to say about this Saturday night game against the Charlotte Hornets in January. Like there's just nothing left to talk about from it. Whereas at least like the worst case scenario in baseball played out yesterday's show should have been like the hardest show for me where the day before was an afternoon game where it was a bad, bad game. So it's the second day of Yusei Kikuchi negativity. There's no yes. game to tee up that night. And then they we get the Gabriel Moreno news. So it's like, oh, sweet. I could just – I did two minutes on Kikuchi, and then it's it's looking ahead to Gabriel Moreno. So the, the 162 is a, a blessing and a curse that way. Let's talk Wednesday's game a little bit here. I know after the loss to Kansas City, uh, Jays fans, myself included, were pretty bummed out about the loss. 
listen, a series win is always a good thing, right? And I, I think the big disappointment was is that they're chasing the Yankees. And, you know, you're following the stats, and you're like, okay, they lose to the Royals. The, J or the Yankees are hot. They're going to steamroll the Twins. There's no way that we don't lose ground to the Yankees coming into the game on Friday and then baseball baseballed. And, of course, the Yankees lost both games, and now the Jays are only seven <laughs> games back. Although the Yankees I, did have that dramatic comeback last night. so Yes. Yes, uh... they did. Yes, they did. So, obviously, the division's the goal. When you look at this team and where they are at, the schedule that lies in front of them and in front of the Yankees, do you personally still think the AL East is a realistic possibility? I do. It's a long season. Seven and a half games is a lot for this time of year. But even if you look at Fangraph's um, projections, and, and I know those things are a grain of salt, but even something like that still has the Jays at a 20% chance to win the division. It's just, first of all, the Yankees probably aren't going to play at 115 win pace the whole season. Uh, their schedule will turn. They will eventually have an injury or a cold streak or whatever. Um, you know, I certainly think so far they've been better than the Jays. There's not much question about that, yeah. but things ebb and flow over the course of the year. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's still within reach. Anytime you're playing at, you know, a 95 win pace or whatever the Jays uh, total plays out to right now, you at least have to, you know, be aware of what the team at the top of your division is doing, because there's going to be some regression at some point. Um, I do think too, that, Second in the division is a really good runner up goal because hosting that three game series of three home games is pretty big. And mm -hmm. particularly, I don't want to do the whole I work for Rogers now thing and I'm checking the, the company pocketbooks or whatever. But that's three games of home playoff revenue after a couple years of limited revenues because of the pandemic. So I'm sure it's a it's a goal up in the offices, at least. Oh, I can imagine. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, I'm curious your thoughts on Nestor Cortez. Is he for real? Is he, he legit? Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> um, he is, right? Yeah, I know that he had that. He had a bad start this week, but that's a, I don't know. That's a it's lot his first of. bad start of the year. <laughs> yeah. That's just, like, we're talking 160 innings over last year and this year now. And I know some of that was out of the bullpen, but that's a pretty good sample of this guy can strike guys out without having a ton of natural swing and miss stuff. And he doesn't walk anyone. So when you put those two things together, like that's a really good starting point. And then he at least does an okay job limiting the kind of hard contact in the air that can kill you at Yankee stadium. So you know, he's going to, it's a pitcher at Yankee stadium. He's going to have some bad games where, um, you know, the ball's flying around or whatever, but he also has the benefit of, of being a lefty where, you know, he'll at least be tough on those lefties who, who have the short porch and right. So, uh, yeah, regrettably, I think he's for real. I did everything within my power to deny that too. And it's kind of at the point now where, yeah, it's undeniable. Yeah, Easily I do. Good. I do do this thing regularly where I, I have like, I usually do it with, with Jays players or Raptors players or whatever, where if you give me, you put 120 seconds on the timer, I can sell you on a guy or bury a guy for you. Like just let me get the fan graphs page or let me get their real yeah. GM page or whatever. And you can do it. You can get there uh, with Cortez. It, it gets a little tough, but it's, you know, the big one for him is he doesn't get a lot of swing and miss. And if you're trying to find a reason that a guy might regress, it's that, well, you're not really getting the truly, truly awful swings on anything other than your sinker, which you don't throw a ton anyway. So maybe guys will figure out how to hit the, the fastball and the cutter hard. But then you look at the numbers and it's like, oh, yeah. Remember when for an entire career people were like, well, you know, a cutter's coming from Mariano Rivera. Why don't you just hit it hard? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, that, it's, it's easier said than done. There's a reason guys are hitting under 200 against that thing. I really do love how you sum that up about the data, right? If you want to find something negative about someone, you just need to dig deep enough. It is there. And I know um, Alec Manoa, obviously a stud. Yeah. Blue Jays fans know it. Blue Jays organization know it. 
Baseball's kind of getting the call on that pretty quick here, too. Although I did just read an interesting article on Sportsnet from Nick Ashburn that really deep-dived into Manoa's stats this year, and I was kind of surprised to see that the splits aren't all that good with him. He hasn't mm -hmm. been good against lefties. They're hitting over 300 against him. Uh, he's not giving up the long ball, but he is not striking them out like he was last year, mostly due to he's not hitting his spot with his slider. His strikeouts are down substantially from last year. However, he's inducing more soft contact, and he's going further into games. What would you prefer, Blake? Do you prefer a pitcher who goes deeper into a game, or would you prefer a guy who's a bit of a strikeout stud? In general, if I'm trying to project the pitcher forward, I would say the swing and miss stuff is the stuff that I'm more confident in sustaining and moving forward. For this particular Jays team, though, they need Manoa to be a seven-inning guy because there are concerns about Kikuchi. There are concerns about Ryu. Stripling's out of the bullpen now, and you're probably not penciling him in for six. Even Barrios has had a couple of those really short starts uh, even though he looked phenomenal last time out. Uh, so I would say for this particular rotation makeup, Gosman be or uh, Manoa rather being a guy who is looking to be more efficient and lean on soft contact, especially with how well the Jays defense has played this year. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with where he's at. I, I do have, I know Nick's piece highlighted the slider in particular. Yeah. Um, his change up against lefties has been fairly ineffective as well. Uh, they're slugging 571 against it. He doesn't throw that to righties, obviously, because he could just kind of pound the, the sinker and the slider. Um, but yeah, if, if I'm him, I'm maybe maybe firing up that fan graphs piece about Adam Simber that I mentioned and be like, hey, how could I get my slider over to lefties a little bit more? Uh, obviously, you're not going to drop the arm slot in the way that, that Simber does. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, you, you've got you've to figure out a, di a bit of a different pitch mix against lefties because the, the changeup's been pretty ineffective. Despite the struggles to lefties, do you think that uh, this new approach is a little bit by design? He's trying to go deeper into games and create more contact? I would think so. Um, you know, there was that moment where a couple starts ago, he loaded the bases in the first inning and then sat down like 16 in a row. <laughs> and he said after the game that Matt Chapman came to him on the mound and was basically like, stop nibbling like you have the defense behind you you don't have to nibble to get out of this and i do think that's a helpful lesson for him um and you know i i get it he's so competitive and he's so fired up all the time i'd want to miss bats too <laughs> and that you know that's a heavy sinker that you can get guys a swing and miss on sometimes but the best thing about a sinker is supposed to be you get bad contact all the time and even if you hit it hard you're probably hitting it into the ground so yeah. i i'm I'm cool with that. It's actually something that I would like to talk to him about. Um, the one drawback of my show being a three to five slot is that's when clubhouses are open. So I, I, I've lost that ability, um, but hoping to talk to him or one of the pitching coach or strategist guys at some point about whether that's a conscious effort or whether it's just a byproduct of his sinker's been his best pitch so far this year. Well, we'll get you Matt Gage if you get us Alec Manoa. How about Perfect. that? Perfect. Fair trade. <laughs> Uh, I love that Matt Chapman came up and said that to Manoa, just a young kid being like, listen, kid, you got the stuff. We're here. Matt Chapman's this... nickname, also the defense. So talking in third person there, right? <laughs> yeah, this this is uh, this is becoming the, the Blue Jays way they fix pitchers. Like Robbie Ray comes and Pete Walker's like, hey, Robbie, stop walking, guys. And he stops walking, guys. And he's yeah. great. <laughs> Matt Chapman goes to Alec Manoa, hey. Stop throwing balls. He stops throwing balls. He starts getting outs. It's uh, it's perfect. And now, like, now someone is gonna tell someone's gonna tell Gosman his next start. Hey man, get that splitter lower in the zone. And then he's fixed again. And simple tweaks, simple yeah, fixes. This is this is why this organization is exceptional. I don't yeah. know why other organizations aren't thinking of this. It's the why same hasn't strategy. Seattle told them not to not to walk, guys? I don't get it's it. Idiots. It's the same strategy my dad has in watching a hockey game. It's just like, we just need to score here. It's like, yeah. okay, thanks, Dad. Yeah. I designed the power play, and it's shoot. Yeah. Shoot, shoot, shoot. <laughs> I enjoy just screaming it at the screen sometimes. Yes. Yep. Okay. That's honestly, we like, with, with a lot of sports stuff, I've, you know, come to my own way to, to looking at it and things like that. But the thing that has stuck with me most from watching sports with my dad when I was a kid is like, I'm still that guy on the power play. Even if I know what they're trying to set up and they're going for <laughs> higher quality shots, 
I'm sitting there every time it gets to a point, man. I'm just shoot, shoot. Why are you shooting it? Pucks on net. Let's go. <laughs> Okay, so you mentioned it right off the very top of, of this talk here. Gabriel Moreno, obviously the number one prospect in this Blue Jays system. Number four overall. Fans incredibly excited. And forget the fans. Everyone is excited, right? I know the news was everywhere yesterday. In your opinion, what do we need to see out of Gabriel Moreno for when Danny Jansen comes back from this injury, for this organization to deal with the for lack of a better term, nightmare that would be carrying and getting playing time for three catchers? Yeah, I, I don't know how much of a nightmare it would be. It's a it's a tough thing developmentally because Kirk and Moreno are both guys you – like Kirk should be getting 500 plate appearances. Moreno should be playing five, four or five times a week at where he's at developmentally. And I think Danny Jansen's been too good to slide into like the Zach Collins level of playing time as a third catcher. So I do think ideally, you know, Moreno probably gets these two weeks or however long it is, uses that information and that experience to go back down and continue working on stuff at AAA. Uh, but if he comes up and hits 300 and there are no questions about his game calling, that's going to be, that's going to force their hand. And, and three catchers is certainly not an ideal roster construction, but you know what else is not an ideal roster construction? Bradley Zimmer being one of the only three guys you have off the bench and the only situation you're comfortable using him in is an eighth inning fielding replacement. Like there's, there's not a lot of utility to the way the bench is constructed right now. So I don't know that you lose a ton having three catchers, especially like they've been running a, a guy short. And at some point they're going to have to remedy that. Like the current date is June 20th that we're anticipating. Um, you can't carry 14 pitchers anymore. Um, we'll see if that gets bumped back again, but that's a potential thing. Uh, and then they'd need an extra bench piece anyway. So um, I still think they'd probably prefer Moreno getting the developmental reps. But look, this guy is, has not taken very long to get acclimated at any level on his way up. And every review, I don't know if you guys saw the, the piece at MLB.com that Keegan Matheson and Julia Kreutz co-wrote about his path up in Venezuela or Arden Zwelling at sports that did a big one in spring training. Like yeah. everyone speaks the world of this guy's work ethic and capacity to learn quickly. So I, I wouldn't be shocked if a couple weeks from now we're like, Oh, Danny Jansen, you take all the time you need on a rehab assignment. It's fine. It's fine. Danny Jansen is on pace for 60 home runs. So, uh, <laughs> which is pretty incredible since he's on pace for like crazy. 40 games played. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Um, I know that with this catcher crunch, I guess you could call it fans start to speculate. Obviously they think that somebody has to be moved. I'm kind of of the opinion that that is not the case, at least not until, the off season, where this decision has to be made. Where are you at on that? Do you think that it's likely one of these guys gets moved at the trade deadline? Or do you think this organization is looking a little further down the road to make that decision? I think they prefer to have it further down the road. When, when we were talking about names like Jose Ramirez before the yeah. season, then yeah, you got to put your best chips in the middle. If you're approaching this deadline where what you end up doing is trying to upgrade the Tapia spot so that Tapia slides down into the Zimmer slot, or you're trying to add a multi-inning bullpen arm, those are not the type of additions that you're giving up a scarce asset, like a really good young catcher uh, to get. It would have, to me, it would have to be like a real needle moving deal because you're not really in a rush with either of these guys. Like you're in a rush to win because you have the pieces to win right now, but they've talked a lot about like maintaining the window for a long time. And a part of that is, you have a 23-year-old and a 22-year-old catcher who, like, realistically, it's the catcher position. None of Neither of these guys are going to play 140 games. So even if one of them eventually squeezes, say Jansen's the one who gets scores out instead of dealing one of Kirk or Moreno, there's plenty of opportunity for two catchers to get enough time and get some DH mm -hmm. time and stuff, like that, especially when you hit like Kirk has been hitting. So I think... Yeah, this is a problem you're you're fine carrying forward given the age of the players and the roster construction and the fact that other spots on the roster are going to start to get more expensive soon. Tay Oscar has to get paid. Um, you know, you'll eventually hit the point with 
Manoa Bichette and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. where they're making more. And having those younger, inexpensive guys who are a big part of your core is a really important thing to kind of sustaining that success. So I don't think they're in a rush. If Jose Ramirez or Jose Ramirez type hits the market, then yeah, you you got to you gotta pony up your best assets. But yeah. I'm certainly not, you know, it's certainly not uh, in the mix in a Rowdy Tellez for Trevor Richards situation. Like you're not... You're not scrambling to get rid of a catcher to that degree by any yeah. means. 37 games in the next 38 days. How likely do you think it is MLB extends the bullpen extension? You think 14? I mean, I feel like they have to, right? Or am I being ridiculous? You would think so, but it's not like this is the first time a team's ever had to do this and the rules no. were in place prior years. Um, I was actually, I was thinking about it the other day. I was going, I went back and read a really bad thing that I wrote very early in my writing career about Curtis Thigpen. And uh, one of the, I was like looking around like that era of the blogs I had wrote. And one of the, there was like a, I forget what the topic was, but basically I was like annoyed that they were only, that they were carrying eight bullpen arms at one point instead of seven. And how far we've come to yeah. where it's like, no, they need 10. They need 10 <laughs> bullpen arms. What do you mean? They like the era of having only arguing for only seven bullpen arms is so far back, even yeah. though it was like this blog was like, I don't know, 14 years ago or something like that. I'm very old. Um, yeah, so but Blake, 14 years ago, like three out of your five starting pitchers would be approaching the 200 inning mark like. yes yeah and now it's like oh if the guy gives you 180 you're you're Stop. over the moon yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um i i would i wouldn't i don't really understand an argument for not extending it like if you're the union side what do you care whether the the 26 man roster is pitchers or hitters right like it doesn't it doesn't change it shifts who is making up the those 26 spots and it maybe shifts a little bit of like oh come arb time you know if relievers are pitching fewer innings so they get a little less in arb or whatever but that's just shifting to the hitters because they would have to then by nature play more because there's fewer of them so i i don't see why the union would have a, a real problem with it and i think for baseball maybe we baby pitchers a little too much but if you're looking at this as like well you want to have the healthiest good teams possible later in the year you do that by giving them some roster flexibility like that couldn't agree more Cabin now if this deal. if this were pre sorry if this were pre the three batter minimum i would say absolutely not and the tampa bay rays specifically should only be allowed to have like three relievers but uh, <laughs> i feel that even even with the three batter rule yeah yeah although all their relievers keep ending up becoming good starters like jeffrey springs so uh i don't know it just forces their hand into having actual starting pitchers now i guess it does uh i did want to talk cabin Biggio really quickly we won't yep. spend too much time on him but he has come back from injury and is truly in peak Biggio form He's hitting, I think, 170 with a 370 on base percentage, which more or less is what you want out of him. Like, that's kind of what he projected as. I mean, obviously, you want to see his uh, average go up, and I think it will a little bit playing Detroit and Baltimore over the next seven games. All that said, you feel it's pretty safe to say Biggio is who he is now and that they're looking at him as a super utility guy and probably not much more? Yeah, I think so. That's how I look at him anyway. Um, I was talking to Keith Law last week on on the Jays Talk Plus show, and he's a guy who's always been kind of negative about Kevin Biggio, right? Um, and it wasn't – like, I don't think he – he he is of the mind he's not worth a roster spot. I wouldn't go that far. I think he's fine in this role. I think if you're the Jays, you could even hope he figures out a way to sustain, like, even if he could OPS, like, 700, right? Like, that's yeah. not – bad for a guy who can help fill in a couple positions yeah the days he's at first base or right field are gonna look weird because that's not like the bat doesn't play at those positions but as a utility guy you don't have the bar's pretty low offensively mm. um although i say 700 and that's like the league average ops this year so maybe that's a little too high but even like the 10 games he's played in since he came back he's ops almost 900 without hitting a home run or anything like that like yeah. he just you walk enough and you keep the strikeouts when he one of the biggest differences between when he looked like 
a good version of BGO versus a bad version of BGO over the years is the strikeout rate came up. And that's when you start having like, okay, if you can put the ball in play on top of the walks, then you're going to bab up your way to a couple hits here and there, and you'll get the odd yeah. double. It's the, when you become a purely two true outcomes guy and every plate appearance is a strikeout or a walk. It's like, so I played hockey growing up and I only got to play baseball, like, like actual baseball one summer is because I was spending half the summer in Newfoundland. So my parents were like, yeah, hey, you can take the summer off hockey. Um, <laughs> And I remember once my dad got really mad at me. He like came to one of my games and uh, I think I like, I don't remember specifically, but it was something like I walked twice and struck out twice. And on the way home, my dad was like, I didn't leave work early and rushed your game to watch you not swing the bat. And that's how I feel sometimes. That's how I feel sometimes with Biggio where it's like, he's going up there and he's like, well, look, this is my first summer playing baseball. I'm not going to do a lot if I swing. And if I walk, I can, you know, I'm on base and I can, Biggio doesn't do this to this extent, but you know, I can steal second. I can steal third. A walk's a yeah. double or a triple when you're playing house league baseball. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, sometimes I see myself in Biggio, <laughs> and uh, that makes me feel negatively about his, his outlook. Uh, I think he could be a fine utility guy, though. Uh, yeah. I mean, a 20% walk rate is insane. Mm-hmm. Like, it just... <laughs> and, like, he's not that great defensively at any of the spots but one of the benefits of having espinal who's such a good defender is like espinal is the everyday guy but he can bounce around positions to make sure that bgo doesn't have to cover a tougher spot right like even those games they subbed out bobachette for a little extra rest the fact that espinal can slide over there or if chapman gets an off day espinal can slide over there and you don't have quite the same defensive drop off i think that makes it easier to use bgo as a kind of utility guy as well I, I was thinking about that with Espinal and Biggio because I, I always like to paint Biggio like the real value is his utility. But it's getting harder and harder to deny that like Espinal is our super utility guy because he plays second base every day. He can cover shortstop and third. And then half the time now he's in the outfield anyways. Yeah. Yeah. With the uh, the 4-3 with defense the, or whatever they the call it. Shift. Yeah. But he's like he's kind of graduated past the super utility thing. Yeah. Like it's just like like he's. In my book, he's written down in pen at second base every day. And then he bounces around, like, if there's funky lineup stuff going on elsewhere. Like, I I don't know. Like, I I get the framing of it for sure. Um, I just think, you know, once you're an everyday guy, it's just you just you're an everyday guy that can play a couple positions. That's I know. Super utility really, like, has a negative connotation to it. Yeah. Everyday second baseman sounds good, but, like. Like you said, let's throw Cavan at second and then have Espinal move wherever, right? Like put Tapia in second base for all we need to do, right? It's like we we referred to Ben Zobris as a super utility guy, and there was like a stretch of six straight seasons where he played 150 games. It's like you're not a utility guy at that point. You're just very flexible. Yeah, (laughs) Very flexible, yeah. Very flexible. So, Blake, I saw a tweet yesterday from a Blue Jays fan, and it said something along the lines of, it is crazy to think that we have seen them grow up together. And then it was a picture of Bo and Vlad in Lansing, in New Hampshire, Buffalo, and now Toronto. Can you think of a comparable to Bo and Vlad in any other sport where two guys have come up together since they were 17, 18? Yeah, maybe not that far back, but I do think of, you know, there are, the easy comparison is Matthews and Marner with the Leafs yes. where they've been yeah. together for almost the entire time together. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time on the same line, which is, you know, the closest you get to, Hey, they shared a left side of the infield or they hit three, four together. Um, so that's one. It's not the same because one was homegrown and one was traded for, but like Kyle and DeMar with the Raptors mm-hmm. very much uh, grew Great up example. together in that yeah. sense. Right. Like, like when Kyle Lowry got to Toronto, DeMar DeRozan wasn't DeMar DeRozan yet. Kyle Lowry wasn't Kyle Lowry yet. And that's that's a little different. Um, but baseball is just a little different with that, right? Like there's no – the so other one would, I guess, be yeah. like Pascal Siakam and Fred Van Vliet were like won a 905 championship together. So like maybe that's the closest comparison. We just don't have minor leagues in basketball to the same degree. But they did win a G League championship together, then an NBA championship together, and as bench guys, and now they're kind of the core together. So maybe that's the best comparison. How about this from the Vancouver Canucks, the Sedin twins? 
Yeah, just <laughs> we're not doing the okay. we're not doing the Vancouver Canucks stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Vancouver Canadians is the only Vancouver team I, I recognize oh, and we'll ruthless. talk about. It. I love right. that, Blake. Thank you. As a Flames fan, I cannot agree more with you on that aspect of hockey. <laughs> I lived in Vancouver for like a year and change and it really sat like being a, a Leafs fan in Vancouver, but like at that point I was trying to like cut my teeth. So I was blogging about both teams and then like both readerships hated me. Cause it's like, well, you're a leaf guy writing about the Canucks or you're a Canucks guy writing about the Leafs. Yeah. It was uh it left me. I, I, there's a reason I haven't wrote a lot of hockey since then <laughs> <laughs> or gone back to okay. Vancouver. Yeah. Um, we'll, we're going to go to list their questions in one second here. I did want to just uh, close up before we do that on the fact that Bowen Vlad, um, they obviously came up together. They've won and lost on the field and in life together. They're kind of like brothers almost. Do you think this might make the likelihood of extending both a little more likely? Or does money rule? rule yeah, the money matter? part is what's tough, right? And there are so many parallels between them where they're both second generation stars. And how does that affect your negotiations? And, you know, um, like Bo's dad was heavily involved with the union when he was a player and has, so I'm sure has like a very get every penny you're worth mentality and they don't, you know, the risk profile isn't the same for those guys that it is for some other guys where you're okay if you get hurt tomorrow. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know what that looks like from a financial side. I think, yeah, you have your, your, your two middle of the order guys set for a long time. That'd be great. I think they like playing together. Like we saw them have that little moment the other day where, um, you know, Bo was kind of giving it to Vlad after the, yeah. the pop up. Um, but then like in the dugout after they're great. And and I remember early in the year, June Lee at ESPN wrote a piece about Bo Bichette's kind of mental approach and how that plays into his leadership. And he really painted the picture that Bo and Vlad have this great yin and yang um, leadership dynamic where Vlad is the guy, he's the raw, raw guy. He's the get it, pick everyone up when they're down, send the goofy group chat text. And Bo is the guy who's at the field first every day, taking it a little bit more serious and, and, you know, knows that his voice will carry a little bit more when he speaks up because he doesn't do it. You know, he's not as gregarious about it as Vlad. So I do think there's a, obviously a great baseball dynamic there. I think the two of them together help make a good clubhouse dynamic by all accounts. So I would like to see them stay together, but if they're both like, we want 35 million a year each, uh, $700 million to commit is a lot. Uh, so I don't know if that works out. Okay. Thank you, Blake. Honestly, thank you so much for taking the time great. to talk with us. It really means a lot, buddy. And it was uh, really fun chatting some Blue Jays with you. We're going to really quickly try and get some listener questions yeah. in here before you go. So, Adam, all yours, bud. All right. I got five, and we got five minutes. So let's blast right. through these. All right. I'm so not good at brevity, so let's see how it goes. <laughs> so Elaine says, no disrespect to Jansen, but long term, it seems like the best catching duo on this team is Kirk Moreno. But Jansen, being the older, more developed, has the least trade value of the three. So would the Jays be better with Jansen Moreno plus a good piece back for Kirk? Or would they be better with Kirk Moreno and a lesser piece back for Jansen? Some of this depends on how confident you are in Kirk's defense and his defensive improvements and that holding up. Uh, because if he ends up where he has to come off of catcher, you don't want to be stuck with just one. But pragmatically, Jansen is older, as Elaine said. He's also already into his RB years, so he's going to get more. He only makes $2 million right now, but he's going to get more expensive more quickly uh, and become a free agent in 2025. So you'll have to make a Jansen decision before you'll have to make a Kirk or Moreno decision. Um, I would think, again, barring uh, Jose Ramirez, not, not quite to that level, but like a really meaningful addition elsewhere, I would have trouble moving Moreno. So... Um, it's a Kirk Jansen decision to me, and some of that's going to depend how Kirk's defense continues to progress. Uh, I would personally think Jansen is eventually the odd guy out, but I've always kind of got the sense the Jays aren't quite as high on Kirk as maybe the fan base is. Okay, very good. Next one comes in from Jay Peterman. Uh, realistic expectations. What kind of numbers does Moreno need to put up in order to stay up? You kind of touched on it with Scott earlier, but. Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not looking at too much. Um, I, I wouldn't expect a lot of power from him 
early on, you know, his isolated slugging, even when he came along in AAA was under a hundred. So um, you're looking at a, for me, it's mostly, you know, it's more process than results. I want to see that that strikeout rate doesn't take a huge jump. I want to see that he's still able to work a walk. Uh, and yeah, the bat, the ball skill is going to dictate a lot of how he performs here. Um, you know, if he hits 270 and OBP's 320, like I think that's that's perfectly fine for a, a first stint in the majors. 270 is probably even a little high, but he is a high bat to ball guy. So um, I, I'm not, but I'm not expecting like power numbers or anything like that. So when you look at like the OPS or the WRC plus or something like that, it might be a little lower because he's just, he's not at that, you know, he can hit a double, but he doesn't even have like power alley power with regularity just yet. Uh, George says, do you think we see Groshans in 2022? <sighs> yeah. Uh, if Biggio is not good, then yeah. Groshans is, uh, he's played pretty well at AAA this year. Um, you know, a, another guy with some positional versatility, uh, his strikeout, the walk profile has really come along. He's walked more than he struck out this year. Uh, which that's always so been a strength impressive. of his. Yeah, it's always been a strength, but his his strikeout rate had been creeping up as he kind of went through the minors. So uh, nice to see that. I haven't got enough, you know, I've watched a handful of Bison's games on MILB TV or whatever, but I haven't, you know, dug in enough to know exactly where his defense is in terms of readiness. Um, you know, would you be comfortable with him at third and second or maybe even some short, shortstop time? I, I'm not sure. Uh, but the bat is certainly uh, playing at the level you hoped. So that's awesome. not really an answer other than <laughs> if Biggio struggles, I do think he's the next man up. Um, awesome. You know, you have Leo Jimenez and Otto Lopez around as well. So maybe it's just whoever's playing the best at the time. But Okay. Uh, next one. Renovations coming to the outfield wall this offseason. Uh, what changes do you want to see to the outfield wall in Toronto? And that one comes mm -hmm. in from Jer. I would like it to be just a tiny little bit shorter so we could see more jump at the wall catches. Like, oh, like yeah. the fact that the fact that the best catch you can have at Rogers center is like a ball that probably would have bounced off the top of the wall for a double. Anyway, I just want oh. a little shorter I so you this. can, you can reach over it. Adam I don't need a guy to fall the over time. the wall. Yeah, yeah. I don't need you to fall over the wall, but the, there's nothing better than a highlight of like the glove bending over the top of the wall to pull one yeah. back. The yeah. fact there's only one highlight that like that that which has made uh, Kevin Pillar like like immortalized him uh, that catch in left field like we should be able yeah. to see more than one of those. Yeah, <laughs> you shouldn't have to do the major league thing where Tanaka like jumps one foot <laughs> off the wall and then stands on top of it and is celebrating the the catch exactly. on top of the wall or whatever. Like you should, yes. you should be able to have a. A highlight real catch at Rogers Center, I think. Agreed. All right, Blake, we'll leave you there. I know that uh, we're short on time here, but thank you so very much for taking the time to uh, talk some Blue Jays and baseball with us, and hopefully we can do it again sometime. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. And, uh, you know, I hope people are enjoying the Jays Talk Plus show on the radio or the podcast. And uh, if you are or if you're not, uh, all ears on feedback and suggestions moving forward because it's still, it's still brand new, and I'm brand new to hosting my own show. So I want to do what Jays fans want to hear. So uh, all ears. Well, I'm loving it, so <laughs> keep it up, bud. <laughs> Great. Thanks, guys.